COVID-19 is not the only unwanted visitor to the state of Michigan. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources is on the lookout for invasive species doing harm to our environment. Joining us now, Joanne Foreman. She's the communications coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources Invasive Species Program. Thank you for being with us uh, on this Thursday. How are you doing? Great, Ronnie. Thanks for having me. Uh, so tell us a little bit uh, first about the program and the focus of the program. Absolutely. Michigan's Invasive Species Program has been ongoing for over a decade so far. And what our goal is, is to work with communities and average citizens and in hopes of preventing invasive species. And if we can't prevent them, we sure want to work to uh, eliminate them as best we can. I, I know you. So this is a program. Oh, go ahead. Oh, so I know you have um, some species that you're focused on right now, but is it hard to get attention on this issue in the middle of a pandemic? You know, that's interesting. Actually, the pandemic has brought a lot more folks outdoors. And when people are outdoors, they tend to notice more things. And in noticing them, they might notice unusual things, whether they're bugs or plants or whatnot. And that actually has helped us get people to report things that they're seeing. Oh, well, see, so that's the upside of the yeah. pandemic. <laughs> yes, definitely the outdoors is a resurgence. So with that, tell us some things that we as just regular people should be looking for. Okay, well, like as I said, you know, there's, there's a lot of different invasive species that either are in Michigan or could get here. So we're urging people to be alert to things that seem unusual or out of place, something that they haven't seen before. One in particular that we're really focused on at this time of year in the winter is hemlock woolly adelgid. Hemlock woolly adelgid is a little tiny, tiny insect, but in mass, it feeds on our hemlock trees. Hemlock trees are some of the sustaining aspects of our Northern forests. So if you're up North, you're probably passing by a lot of them. This tiny little insect, like I said, will suck sap out of hemlocks and can eventually kill them over time if left untreated. So right now is a time when you can see them because they create these small round, what we call ovisacs. They look like the tips of a Q-tip. And those end up on the undersides of the branches of the hemlock trees near the needles. So if you're out in the forest, say you're gonna snowshoe or hike or enjoy some of those things that you've picked up as hobbies again since the pandemic started, uh, this is a good time to just look up at the understory, see what you can see. If you see those little cottony masses, that's likely to be hemlock woolly adelgid, <clears throat> excuse me. And that can be reported to us through our website, which is michigan.gov slash invasives. So I guess the best thing for people to do would be to what, snap a picture? maybe so that you can see what yes. they are talking about and how would they give you the exact location especially if they're okay. out in in the middle of the woods right right and and that's a good point um there is an app that you can download on your phone it's called the midwest invasive species information network or MISIN, m-i-s-i-n for short you can look it up under MISIN, either through your phone or on your computer and download the app, it allows you to locate the spot where you're taking the photo and make the report right there on your phone. So that's uh, that makes it nice and easy, but also it helps uh, your team to be able yes. to identify the exact location as well. Correct, that information goes right to our technical experts and they follow up on those reports. And so with that, what else should we be looking for while we're out? Well, something that you, you can look for not only when you're out, but when you're in receiving those Christmas packages is another invader that's not yet in Michigan, but we're concerned about it. This is the spotted lanternfly. Currently, the largest infestation is in Pennsylvania. It was just recorded in Ohio this summer. Now, this pest is actually a sap-sucking winged bug. It's called a fly, but it doesn't look like a house fly. It looks kind of more like a, a moth when its wings are folded. And when it opens up, it has the black and yellow abdomen like a bee. So when it's folded up, it's sort of a grayish color with black spots. But then when it opens up, it has red on the wings too. So it's a very showy creature. Uh, the problem with this bug is that, again, it's sap sucking, but it tends to attack hardwood trees 
and fruit crops. So this could be a very big concern for our grape growers, even our hops growers in Michigan, as well as our apples. So we want to take a look out for this. The reason we're concerned about it now is because not only is it in Pennsylvania and Ohio, but just recently we found dead bodies of these bugs in some packing materials in two different locations in Michigan. So as I said, people are receiving lots of packages now. Be alert, look for, I mean, if you see a bug in a package, you should definitely get a hold of us anyway. But if you're seeing a bright red winged uh, bug there, let us know because we're concerned about them getting through with shipping. Another way this bug could get here, it doesn't fly very far by itself, so it's not gonna fly here, is um, by laying egg masses. And these egg masses look sort of like chewing gum or putty and they stick to lots of different things, including vehicles and even packing materials or things that you might get shipped that have been sitting outdoors. So as we're sitting here waiting for our FedEx packages, be vigilant. And again, something unusual that you see on or in a package, please contact us. I will say it never once ever occurred to me to see if there was a dead bug in one of my packages. And if so, <laughs> if I did see that, because I, I'm sure I've noticed that once or twice before, I would never think, to uh, contact anyone about it. Well, and, and there's so many packages and things being shipped here and there right now, especially again, the pandemic has really ramped this up. So, you know, this is, this is something that, yeah, if you hadn't thought about it before, it's definitely something that you can do and should do. And, and obviously the reason behind so much of this is because these critters can have a, a severe economic impact uh, for our, on our economy. Absolutely, absolutely. In the case of spotted lanternfly, um, what happens is, I mean, the bugs themselves, they don't look very harmless or very, they look very harmless, I should say. But when they're, what they tend to do is they hatch and then they stay in the same location. As they grow, they begin sucking sap out of plants or trees in a sort of mass, you know, so there could be hundreds of these bugs. So if we're talking about a vineyard or something, we could see damage because they release this sort of excrete a honeydew. It's a sticky substance and it doesn't smell very good, but it also attracts mold and it also attracts wasps and other things like that. So the mold can actually like kill the plants themselves. Or if it were on the grapes, you know, you wouldn't be able to sell them for instance. But it, imagine too, what this can do to your backyard if spotted lanternflies are in the area, we're hearing this from Pennsylvania, that people's decks and things are getting covered with the sooty mold and it's just disgusting. So not only has it, has it an economic, potentially a, a potential economic impact, but also just our sort of outdoor lifestyle can be impacted as well. So it's one thing to try to track it, but you find it, how do you stop it from, you know, continuing to be a bigger problem then? Well, that's why what we call early detection is super important. If we can catch something coming early on when only a few have arrived in Michigan, that allows us to contain the infestation and work really hard to eradicate it. If we don't notice it and it ends up springing up in multiple areas and they start breeding or reproducing at, at the rates that they do, then pretty soon we have a full on outbreak and then we're sort of behind the gun in terms of getting, getting anything taken care of. So people being vigilant and people helping us out is really the way to slow or prevent the spread of these invasives. You know, back in the beginning of the pandemic, we heard a lot about uh, the, the killer hornet. Whatever happened to that? <laughs> it never made it here, right? <laughs> well, that, that's, that's a great story because it, it did go national really, really fast. And from my understanding, that was out in Washington state, they found the tree that was infested with the murder hornet nest and they were able to use some interesting techniques, including wrapping the tree in cellophane and then bombing it basically to get rid of the murder hornets. So that was a neat, <laughs> a neat process to see, but hopefully, you know, that, that's the kind of thing. Somebody sees it, they report it. And once they're able to, you know, located, they're able to work very quickly uh, to eradicate. So that's the kind of end story that we always hope for with invasives. So we hear about these stories, but it's fascinating to me what you and um, so many people on your team actually do each and every day. 
So is there somewhat of like an alert or a bulletin that comes out from various states to say this has been spotted here and then that's how you all work together to track it? Yes, absolutely. We work with federal partners as well as state partners. We work very closely with especially the Great Lakes states, but across the U.S. and communicate about what threats are, uh, you know, are coming in and things like that. So the federal government is really excellent help with the USDA um, alerting us with those kinds of pests, but we also work within the Great Lakes region for the aquatic pests that we're concerned about. Joanne Foreman with us here on the Oakland County Mega Cash. She's the communications coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and Basis Species Program. So um, I'm sure there's, the list is long. Are there a oh, few yeah. others that you want uh, the public to try to be on the lookout for? Sure. Well, one other that's recently come up and I want to bring up because it's the first sighting that's um, in Michigan. This is called mile a minute weed. It's a vine that grows very, very quickly, hence the name, of course. It doesn't grow a mile a minute, but it can grow up to six inches a day or 25 feet in a couple weeks. So this vine is uh, an Asian vine that made its way into the US in the 30s, I think, but it wasn't, it, it hasn't spread very much. It was on our watch list because we are concerned about what it might do for areas like Christmas tree farms, anywhere you have you know, small plants that you're trying to nurture into large trees or whether you've done a replanting or something, this vine comes in and it likes the sun. So what happens is it tends to use trees to grow upward and in climbing those trees, it can actually smother the trees with its growth. Um, this uh, vine also has a little blue fruit and the birds really like those. So they tend to eat the fruits and then disperse it. And it could be miles away from an original plant. So on, again, being on the lookout for something unusual, that's how this was cited initially and sub submitted to us. And we sure hope that again, people are looking for unusual things. If you're looking so for mile a minute weed right now, it might be dried up for the year. The leaves are very, unique in that they're triangular shaped, almost like an equilateral triangle. The fruits, which are blue and look like about the size of peas and grow in a cluster, they may still be visible on plants. So Joanne, once you identify one of these species, is there a process to not only eradicate it, but also to try to track how it got here? Well, tracking how it got here can be difficult, especially for instance, with the mile a minute weed. The infestation that we looked at had been there for a couple of years and because we could tell by just how many plants there were. But in terms of tracking it, we have to assume in that case that it was probably a bird that came in. Um, other cases like the spotted lanternfly where it's human movement, that's maybe sometimes easier to track. Uh, a lot of these species do move into Michigan because of human movement, whether it's something that accidentally got stuck on our vehicle, like a, an egg mass from a spotted lanternfly, or whether it's a plant that someone saw somewhere else and decided they really wanted in their garden, those kinds of things we often, mostly unknowingly, are the cause of bringing in new species. You're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. Joining us on the Oakland County Megacast this morning is Joanne Foreman. She's the communications coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources Invasive Species Program. How has um, work changed for you and members of your team during the middle of this pandemic? Well, it's been a lot different. Like I said, you know, um, we have been getting more reports from the public because the public is outside. Um, on the flip side of that, many of us have not been able to return to offices or the field, um, but we have gotten special permission in certain cases to continue field work, especially with our red swamp crayfish and our grass carp uh, initiatives that were going on. Um, most field workers are now back in the field. For instance, the Hemlock Willie Adelgid surveys are underway right now on our Lakeshore counties around Lake Michigan. Um, but it has really, in some ways, raised, help us raise awareness because people are, are looking at the outdoors more carefully. But it's also um, given us 
new and different ways to work just like everybody else has. <laughs> right. And, and do you worry that there is going to be some type of longer term impact that the pandemic is going to have on our environment here in the state of Michigan? That's a really interesting question. I will say that, you know, people are traveling less. So in some ways, like I said, human transport is a, you know, brings in invasives. So I think that maybe less may have moved or come in this year because of the um, decrease in travel. But in terms of looking at it long term, I think it's it's given people, I think that renewal of interest in nature, I think is probably the, the most important part. I think that and people having the time to learn new things because they're home more has really helped us in a lot of ways. And I'm hoping that that trend keeps going. And that could even spark future um, employees for the uh, Department of Natural Resources. Oh, I would hope so. I would hope so. There's so many bright young folks out there. And this is this is a, such an interesting field to be, you know, to be part of. I know it's been tough for so many organizations when it comes to students and internships. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can talk about that or if you had the opportunity to work with any, but are you keeping up um, the internship program there? at the uh, MDNR? Well, currently, I mean, we did have a hiring freeze, so we weren't able to, for several months to bring in any interns, but with um, the new budget and things, we are beginning those back up again. There are a lot of opportunities, especially in the DNR with our parks, and there's already announcements that have gone out for hiring for the spring. So if folks are interested in the outdoors and careers, there's certainly a great place to start with the DNR. Yeah, and on top of that, too, who doesn't want to work outside? Exactly, exactly. I wish I could be outside more often. <laughs> <laughs> but Joanne, uh, anything else that maybe we didn't touch on that you want to bring up and let our listeners and viewers know about? Well, I think if you're looking for information on invasive species, we have a whole array of those species that we're most concerned about, whether they're here or whether we're afraid they might be coming here on our website, which again is michigan.gov slash invasives. And you can learn a lot about how invasives move and the kinds of things that you can do in your daily life to prevent that movement, whether it's making sure that you, you know, brush off your boots and things before you get in the car after leaving a natural area so you don't end up moving seeds to a new location or cleaning and draining and drying your boats after you're um, done on the lake so you don't you know, inadvertently move some new weeds or even organisms to another water body. But all of those uh, pieces of information, as well as some teaching tools for schools, are available on our website. Oh, that's great. And so before we let you go, what do you think is the biggest threat uh, to Michigan and our environment right now um, as we continue to go through this crisis? Crisis related then, huh? <laughs> or no, just in general, actually, in general. In general, in terms of invasive species, I think still our <laughs> biggest threat and biggest concern is invasive carp coming up um, through the Chicago area waterway system. We are still, the state is highly concerned about that. That could be devastating to our Great Lakes. And so, you know, of all the things, that is the thing that we are most focused on and continue to work to cooperate with other states and the federal government to get movement um, to put new barriers there. Yeah, so give us a little bit of background for the people not familiar with uh, why that's such an, a big issue. Okay, so, so there are three species of invasive carp that have moved up um, into Chicago in the um, what they call the cause, the Chicago area waterway system. Um, those are big head silver and black carp. Now you may have seen the silver carp videos where they're jumping out of the water when the motors are running and they're hitting the boaters and things like that. Those, that's only one. The, the big head is a even larger fish. It doesn't jump like the silver do, but it still eats. They eat so much. Right now in certain areas of the waterway, 90% of what they call the biomass, so the live fish, 90% is invasive carp. So what that means is what's happening to the rest of the fish is they're disappearing. 
not because the carp are eating them, but the carp are eating their food and they're crowding them out. So imagine something like that coming into the Great Lakes, you know, our beautiful waters where we recreate, where we fish and things like that. And we could be losing species of fish, losing our commercial fisheries, as well as having struggles with recreation because nobody wants to go out on a boat and get hit with a car, you know? So <laughs> this is very important. The economic impacts could be enormous to the Great Lakes states if these fish are able to get up through that waterway into Lake Michigan. So right now, the Army Corps of Engineers has designed a plan to put barriers in at an area called Brandon Road. It's a, it's a lock and dam system. And so there's a lot of processes that have to be gone through and we need you know, funding allocated from Congress in order to make this happen. And we're talking about a lot of funding as well. A lot of funding, yeah. It's not pocket change for sure. <laughs> Do you feel like you're constantly trying to fight for the funding because there are so many other things going on in the world right now? And there are, I mean, priorities are changing every day. And right now our greatest priority is the pandemic, of course, you know, and, and, and it's hard to put something up against pandemic relief. Um, but, but yet the fight continues. I mean, it's, it's, it's an issue that, you know, right now we've been lucky. We have not found these uh, fish in the Great Lakes, but, you know, someday they could get through the existing structures and we could end up with a real problem on our hands that, again, prevention is so much less expensive than trying to mop up afterward. And, you know, would we even be able to remove those fish if they came? So it's, it's money one way or the other, but we're hoping that our economies, our Great Lakes economy uh, is not impacted by that invader so many things to juggle in the environment as well. Uh, Joanne, anything else that you want to touch on before we let you go? Not, nothing that comes right to mind, but I want to thank you so much for bringing me on and um, opening the conversation about invasives. Uh, no, I, I always learn something new, so it's been great having you. Quickly, though, before we let you go, what's that app again? The app is the Missin app. Just look it up as M-I-S-I-N and it stands for Midwest Invasive Species Information Network. Okay, and great. Download it on your phone and you'll be all ready to go outdoors and help us out. And that is, um, that's what uh, we are all trying to do during this COVID-19 pandemic, if anything. It is helping us find ways to uh, bring together and be a community. And so since you're outside, go ahead and uh, download the app. I'm sure it's a free download. It is, yes. It and, and it'll make it easy for you and uh, learn a few things and help out uh, nature as well. Uh, Joanne, it's been so great having you with us. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Have a great day.